Sahorayim Tovim, good afternoon, Baruch Hava. welcome to the teaching ministry of Harlingen Messianic Synagogue, we welcome you. We're glad to have you both here in, in, uh, in person and on the live stream, we welcome you. A few announcements before we get started, first of all, uh, I wanted to thank my son Richard for covering yesterday, it was actually a surprise to me because I had told him, because uh, the, they had told us that mom just had a few days left and so wanted to spend as much time with her as possible. And so I told him, well, have a video ready. We had there several good Messianic teachers and I said, have a video ready and just we'll show a video. And so he shocked me too when he came up and, and uh, did his part. So you say where he gets it from. <laughs> We're an emotional family. But anyway, I um, uh, want to, <laughs> what was that? <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, um, um, she did pass away uh, very early Monday morning. She made it through uh, Resurrection Day and um, um, literally like about midnight is when she passed away. And so um, we're very thankful. Um, it was one of those really cool things because I don't know how many of y'all used to watch uh, the Billy Graham Crusades and things like that, and there was a, a gentleman who used to sing for him called George Beverly Shea, and he was my mom's favorite singer. And so I had put on, I had taken a little speaker uh, over and took my phone over and I started playing George Beverly Shea music on YouTube. And uh, um, she started humming along with him. It was so cool. And she hummed through two or three songs. And then she started having trouble. And so my sister gave her some medication to help her breathing. And uh, she fell asleep and she didn't wake up. And so it was, she went to sleep praising God and singing songs of her love for God. And to be honest, that's the way we should all want to go. Not struggling with it. She was very much at peace with everything. In fact, she had told my sister the day before, I want to go home. And my sister said, which home do you mean? And she said, she said, do you mean heaven home or you mean home home? And she says, well, both. But I want to go home. She wanted to be with dad. She missed him. She missed her sister tremendously. Most of all, she wanted to go and be with her Savior. And so we're very thankful for her long life and the time that she had. And uh, uh, we'll be talking about some of this in just a little bit. But anyway, um, thank you very much for your condolences and your support and your prayer. We appreciate this. Thank you for putting up with us for these uh, last six months that have really been hard. Miss Wilma, very glad to be back in the service today. And she, she came, was able to come last week because I stayed. And, but uh, she's very glad to be back in the service today um, and be with us. Um, the, the services, the, the viewing will be Monday from 1 o'clock till 7 o'clock. Um, at Trinity over on Harrison across from St. Anthony's Church. Uh, it's the big one with the, uh, you know, the, the it's a big arch building um, over on Harrison. Um, and so that will be Monday from 1 o'clock to 7 o'clock. Told you it comes in waves. <laughs> I was good all morning today. I thought, okay, I'm going to get through this. Um, the the memorial service will be from seven o'clock to nine o'clock and basically it's not going to be a lot of talking because she said i don't want a lot of talking she said i want a lot of singing we were a singing family um and so she said i just want a lot of singing and so that's what we're going to do we're going to do a lot of singing and uh so uh we welcome you to come and join with us as we remember her um she was a part of this congregation um, and so um, un until uh, she came, she joined with us until 
uh, I got sick uh, with cancer and uh, I think she even came then. Um, and then when COVID hit, that's when she really was not able, she was already 95 or something. And she wasn't able to get out anymore after that. Um, and her, she kind of went downhill, not able to walk and things like that. So, but anyway, she was faithful to the, to the services. She gave her tithe here. Um, and so um, we want to honor her memory. Um, so um, on, so it will be, the viewing will be one, two, seven. Um, and then the uh, memorial service will be from seven to nine. On Tuesday will be the burial. We're not having a service. On Tuesday, we'll be leaving the funeral home about 10 o'clock and going out to uh, Montmeda uh, Cemetery uh, between San Benito and Rio Hondo. Um, and uh, the service out there will start at about 11 o'clock. So uh, we thank you for, again, for your condolences and all of your help. Um, our, our, my family is going to be meeting here um, after the cemetery. Um, so tomorrow um, we're going to be setting up the tables and any, all of that. So if there's anybody who can help us do that, we would appreciate that get set up. And so thank you, Connor. Uh, yes, the, 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 actually the young, the young people's group are going to uh, help us and we staple programs together and uh, several things to, to get done tomorrow. Um, so if you can help us with that, we're just moving the chairs over to the other room and setting up. We have about nine tables, about four, about 60 people or so uh, to set up in chairs and everything. So if you can help out with that, we would greatly appreciate that. Um, 11 o'clock. Um, let's make it about 11 o'clock. Um, and um, also then um, Bible studies. Uh, we will not have Bible study um, tomorrow uh, because of getting ready for the, the funeral and everything. So we won't be having Bible study tomorrow. Um, and then after all of this, um, my great niece passed away about a month ago. We asked for prayer about two months ago now. We asked for prayer for the family and everything. So um, Richard and Charity, uh, my sister and I will be going up to Brownwood uh, for the funeral service, which will be next weekend. So we've got two funerals in the family back to back. Um, so um, we'll be traveling up there. Josh will still be here to lead the liturgy. Miss Wilma will still be here uh, for any, you know, any of the needs that you have. Um, and it is my privilege to announce that that great Comedian debonair, um, Keeley. No, <laughs> Raymond Orta will be uh, will be teaching next next week, and so um, come ready. I'm sure you'll have some good laughs. Okay, so uh, <laughs> no pressure. No, no. Uh, but uh, no, and it's up to him whatever he chooses to do uh, in the service to teach. Um, and by the way, I fired Richard. Uh, these 10-minute messages just don't cut it here. I'm sorry, but he's. I told him, I said, you're going to spoil the people. You can't do that. But anyway, um, so, uh, but uh, no, uh, we want you to come. We want everyone to come, And, and uh, but Raymond will be teaching. Um, and so I'm, sh I'm sure you'll have uh, uh, a, go a good time in the Lord. And, and, and no pressure. It's a... It's okay to laugh in service. You think that God doesn't have a sense of humor? He made me, so, you know, I mean, what can I say, all right? So, um, but uh, God has a, a, he created man in his likeness and in his, in his image. And his timing is perfect, and he has a great sense of humor, okay? And so, you know, people have this, this idea that Jesus was just always sad. Yeshua, he was always sad, and he has this, you know, he has this very straight look on his face. He was a comedian, okay? He was the top comedian, okay? He had a good sense of humor. And so it's okay to laugh. The joy of the Lord is my strength. So we can laugh and enjoy and have a good time. Uh, my family, you know, we're, we're all 
we're, we, you know, we, we love to laugh. Our family has always loved to laugh. And it's, very, it's actually very difficult for us to be serious, even in serious times, because funny thoughts come to your head. And you have to tell somebody, and then everybody starts laughing, and then people think you're being inappropriate. No, we're just enjoying the goodness of God, even in serious situations. I mean, there's times, yes, and, and there's times to take it down, and there's times to cry, and there's times to rejoice. But I guarantee you, you know, when I get together with my brothers and sisters, there's going to be a lot of laughing taking place. Okay, so... Uh, so anyway, so Raymond will be taking care of that um, for us next week. And then the following week is Passover, Pesach, uh, which will be Monday, the 22nd, 7 o'clock here. If you have not signed up, uh, uh, okay, see Miss Wilma today. This is the last day um, for just the synagogue, okay? So if you have not signed up and told her how many tickets you need, you need to do that today because tomorrow we're opening it up. Because I, I'm not kidding you, uh, in the past we have literally packed out this building. We've had people from the synagogue would have to uh, not participate, not eat, because people we would have guests coming in and things like that. And that's why we started the sign-up system. So um, if, uh, uh, if you want to participate, that will be 7 o'clock on Monday the 22nd. Okay, so that's two weeks from t tomorrow, I believe, yes. So uh, that Sunday, by the way, we will also be setting up, okay? So there won't be any Bible study for two weeks. The next Bible study will be the 28th, Sunday, the 28th of April. Uh, so no Bible study for the next two weeks. And again, if you want to help set up, Ms. Wilma would greatly appreciate it because there, it, the Pesach is very special. Um, and there's a lot of things to do, a lot of setting up and preparation and everything. So if you can help with that, that would be greatly appreciated. All right. Um, please don't forget your tithes and offerings um, so that we can continue the ministry here. We appreciate that. Uh, we have uh, Zelle. We have PayPal. We have uh, uh, several accounts. Uh, we have the box over here. If you bring it with you, we have the box over here. Um, and so we appreciate that so that we can continue on. All right. Um, if you would turn this morning, I'm going to shift gears just for today. And then uh, when we get back um, the following week, we'll get back with our creation series, um, which we're, we're almost finished with that section. And then we'll move on to Genesis chapter 2. But uh, this morning we're going to do something different. And so if you would, Proverbs chapter 4, let's go to our Father in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we love you. We thank you so much for your life, for your goodness, Father, as we were just singing a moment ago. That I will forever sing of your goodness. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. And with my mouth I will make known your faithfulness. Because you are faithful to us, even when we're not faithful to you. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the great salvation which we have through the sacrifice of our Savior, Yeshua the Messiah. His death on the cross, his burial, his resurrection. And so, we thank you for this. We thank you for eternal life, Father that even though our loved ones leave us here from this life, they go, Father, into Olam Kaba, the world to come. Father, one day we will join them there with no more tears, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more dying, no more, no more crying because of, of this great salvation. Holy Spirit of God, I ask that you would breathe upon these words and speak through me. Father, that we may be encouraged to continue in this life, even though it's difficult, even though it has many hardships. And we do have broken hearts, and we do shed tears. Father, remind us of what you have prepared for us. 
And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would breathe upon these words and speak. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Through Yeshua we come. And all God's people say, Amen. So Proverbs chapter 4. This verse came to me this past week. I love how God works. I love how God gives to us appropriate messages at appropriate times. I can remember many times how I would be preparing messages and over the years, and I would be sitting there at the keyboard and playing music, listening to music while I'm studying and while I'm preparing, while I'm typing everything out. And I would ask God to give me the words to speak. I would ask God to show me, to encourage me, to show me, is this correct? Is this, and, and understand that when I'm teaching, I do this to this day. I don't want to make mistakes. I don't want to make doctrinal mistakes. I don't want to be incorrect. I want to make sure that what I'm teaching is truth. And so I always ask God to show me truth as I'm preparing, not just while I'm teaching, but even as I'm preparing and getting ready. And songs would come on. Just at the right time, at the appropriate time. Every Shabbat morning on the drive in, to hear, we listen to a certain radio program. And this morning, that program, it's music, spiritual music. This morning, every single song was about heaven. And I pointed that out to my wife. Every one, it was all about heaven. Now, why would God do that? He knows that I need to hear that. I need to rejoice. I need those songs in my heart. So God gave me this verse. The day after my mother passed. And I'm going to share with you this morning, this is called From the Heart, Things That I Learned from My Mother. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 25 and 26 says this, Let your eyes look directly ahead and fix your gaze straight in front of you. Clear a level path for your feet so all your ways will be firm. That hit me. Let your eyes look directly ahead and fix your gaze straight in front of you. Clear a level path for your feet so all your ways will be firm. What is God telling us? He's telling us no matter what is going on in your life, keep your focus. 
you are hopeless. In other places, he says this. Do not look to the right hand. Neither look to the left hand. But keep your eye on the path that is before you. Do not let things distract you. Distract me from what? from who I am and from why I am here, from what my purpose in this life is, no matter what else is going on. What is the purpose of my life? And the reason why this verse touched me so much this week is, you see, it was one week ago this week that I was diagnosed with cancer six years ago. They thought that I had stage three colon cancer. And they thought that I was going to die. And in fact, I did almost die five times. I had four separate surgeries, five. And in fact, at the end of it all, when they thought that I would, should be getting better, my intestines completely fell apart and I went septic. I went into septic shock, passed out at the house. My wife and my son threw me in the car. They didn't throw me, but put me in the car and my wife drove like 80 miles an hour all the way up to DHR from Rio Hondo all the way up to Edinburgh because those were my doctors up there. And so they're the ones who had to deal with me. And so she drove me 80 miles an hour all the way up the interstate to DHR. Security guard, they, they had called ahead of time. A security guard was waiting there at the emer emergency room and he came running out with the wheelchair and picked me up out of the car and put me in the wheelchair and wheeled me in. The last thing I remember is telling my wife, standing there about midnight that night, telling her, I don't feel very good. And she said, I threw up and passed out in the living room of the house. And I don't remember anything else until I woke up over a week later. <laughs> because I was in, they, they took me in and I, my blood pressure was unstable, my sugar was unstable, everything about me was unstable. And the doctor finally came out and told my wife, he has 24 hours. He told them, you better start making plans. And where we're burying my mom on Tuesday, my mom was going to put me there because I didn't have any place to be laid. I was in a coma for over a week. They opened me up and did exploratory and they found that my intestines had fallen apart. And so they used suction, removed all the infection that they could get out started heavy medications, heavy antibiotics. After they were done, they put me, they didn't close me up. They left me open, put me in ICU. And I stayed open for a week. Every day they would take me back to the operating room, open back up the wound, unpack it, suck out all the infection, repack it, take me back to my room. And I can tell you things that I saw 
Some of it good, some of it not good. Because I was going back and forth between the two sides. What do I mean? Living or going to the other side and coming back and going to the other side and coming back. When they diagnosed me with cancer. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. I never, you know, people may wonder when's he going to stop talking about this. I'm never going to stop talking about this. This is what changed my life. This had such an impact on me. This changed everything. It is a miracle that I'm here today. Multiple miracles. But when they diagnosed me six years ago today, I told Wilma, we're not going to cry and we're not going to live in fear. God's will be done. He knows what he's doing. And if his will is for me to die, then die I will, but I know where I'm going. And I have family that I haven't seen in years. I haven't seen my dad in 20 years. I haven't seen my grandmother in 40 years. I have people on the other side that I met. I told my children, we met. I told them, we're not going to cry. If God's will is that I go on, then I go on. If God's will is for me to stay, then I will stay. And we told every doctor and every nurse those very words. You think you're in charge? God's in charge. If it's his will for me to live, then I will live. If it's his will for me not to live, then I will go on, no matter what you do or say. When I saw these words this week, it reminded me of that time. God says, keep your eyes fixed on the road in front of you. Let nothing be a distraction to you. Not life, not death. Don't let anything distract you. Of what God is doing in your life. Because you see, we have things that come at us from every direction. All the time. Every moment. Every day. There are things that will take our eyes off of the path, that will take our eyes off of the focus, that will take our eyes off of our purpose. It will take our eyes off of Yeshua. And if we let it, we'll lose sight. We will lose sight of why we're here. Isaiah chapter 50, in verse 7, speaking of the Messiah, and the life that he would live on this earth, and actually speaking about when he would head to Jerusalem, as is this time of the year, it's what the Passover is about, that he would leave Galilee and make his way to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem. And prophesying about that time, Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7 says, For Adonai Elohim will help me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Watch this. Therefore, I set my face like a flint. And I know that I will not be ashamed. Saying what? 
when he left Galil, when he began his journey to Jerusalem, he would not be deterred. He knew he was going to die. He knew what the price of this act was. He knew what they were going to do for him, to him. He knew. And his disciples even asked him, why are you doing this? Why are you going there? You know that they seek to kill you. And what does he say? The appointed hour is close to hand. I must do what the Father has sent me to do. He said several times, he said, I did not come to do my own will. I came to do the will of the Father who sent me. And so when the time came, when the appointed hour came, he did not lose his focus. That's what this word, this Isaiah 50, verse 7 is about. He set his face like a flint to Jerusalem. What does that mean, like a flint? Like a rock. He would not be stopped from going to his place of sacrifice. He knew he was going to be crucified. And he would not be stopped. He would not be deterred. Why? He must do. Before the foundation of the world, this was the plan. And he knew that he must do this. As tremendous and horrific as the events ahead were going to be for him, he faced it. As we would say, like a man. He faced it fearlessly. Willingly, he would not be deterred in laying down his life. We say that we're his followers. And yet we get so discouraged so many times, so many things coming at us and being thrown at us. And everything is pulling our attention, pulling our, our thought, our mind, our focus. How do we do this? The way he did it. Set your face like a flint on the purpose that God has put in you. And do not turn from it. Do not be deterred. Do not be turned to the side. Do not be distracted. And that was my mom and my dad. They worked. They served in ministry. They came down here to the valley. My dad was from San Antonio. My mom was Philadelphia. They met during World War II. My dad was assigned to the USS Denver uh, light cruiser that was harbored. It was, had just been built and was docked at Philadelphia Harbor. He was from San Antonio. He had gone out to San Diego for training, and then they shipped him to Philadelphia to catch the ship. He was one of the very first men on the ship. He's what is called a plank owner. One of the first 100 men to be on the ship. In fact, he was among the first group of the first day that they opened the ship for the sailors to come on board. My 
They would take the ship out, running tests, making sure that everything was working, and like anything new, everything wasn't working. They were having problems with one of the engines. One of the propellers wasn't turning properly. They'd have to come back into port, work on it, take it back out for trials, come back in, take it back out, and it took them about six weeks to get everything somewhat workable fashion. So one of the times when they came back into Philadelphia, my dad and a couple of his friends got off the ship and they were walking downtown Philadelphia and they were walking through a park and they saw a very pretty young lady and her friend walking through the park and my dad instantly was smitten and walked up to her and asked her for a date. And that beautiful young lady, who was my mother, agreed to the day, total stranger, wacko Texan. She said, okay, I'll go out with you on one condition. And he said, what's that? And she said, Tomorrow is Sunday. You go to church with me. And that will be our first day. Now, my dad had grown up Southern Baptist. My mom was Presbyterian. Opposites attract, I guess. My dad had been living, my, my grandfather was a lay evangelist, that is, he wasn't ordained, but he would travel around to churches as an evangelist, San Antonio, Southern Baptist. But my dad had gotten on kind of the wild side. But he agreed to go with my mom to church, and so their first date, mom didn't think he was going to show up. That's why she made that condition. Because what kind of wild Navy sailor is going to agree to their first date being at church? <laughs> he showed up. And so their first date was to J.R. Miller Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. By the way, that church is still there today. And because mom and dad became missionaries after the war, they still financially support my mom. In fact, we called to tell them that mom had passed away. And the pastor said, we asked if they wanted us to return the check that would be coming. And he said, no, put it in her account. We want to help with, with the expenses. They have supported mom and dad since World War II. What I'm telling you is this. Dad gave us our doctrine and our teaching. But it's mom who built within us our character. In their second sea battle, out to the Pacific, and in their second sea battle, Dad's ship was hit by a torpedo. And his best friend was killed. And dad wrote my mom a letter. And in the letter he asked her, who's responsible for these souls? Because my dad would tell you that 
the way he was raised and the way he grew up, well, that was the pastor's job, the Sunday school teacher's job, the deacon's job, but it wasn't my job. To tell these people about salvation, about the Savior. And so he wrote my mom because he was very bothered. He had no idea whether this friend of his had made it into eternal life or not. He had no idea about his spiritual condition, and this bothered my dad greatly. And so he wrote her a letter, and he asked her, who's responsible? And my mom wrote him a letter back and said, you are. And that's the way she was. She didn't mince words about things like this that were important. She wrote him directly back saying, you are responsible. Love your neighbor as yourself. You are responsible for the people who cross your way. You are responsible for the people whom you beat along life's way. You're responsible. That's why God is sending them to you. And my dad made a vow to God. And the vow that he made to God was this, that if God would spare him and get him home from the war, number one, he would marry Florence Mildred Cook from Philadelphia. And number two, He would serve God any way, anywhere that God would place him. I will serve you for the rest of my life. After the war, they did get married. The war ended in August. They got married in January. Dad went to Columbia Bible College in Columbia, South Carolina, graduated. And in 1957, he and my mom packed up not all of their kids. They left some of them, some of the children, the older children with my grandmother. Brought the two younger ones and started for Texas. By the way, my mom's favorite verse was, in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. And she would tell us, and that means even the state of Texas, because she did not like Texas. And so she said, she would tell us, no, what, whatsoever state I am, even if it's the state of Texas, they're in to be content. And so she and dad came down to serve dad here. They stopped in San Antonio to visit my grandmother there. And I did not mention to you that she was nine months pregnant. In 1957, traveling in a 1955 Mercury station wagon, pulling a trailer with a few of their possessions. No AC. Two young boys. So when they stopped at grandmother's, she went into labor. And so my next older brother, Joel, was born in San Antonio on March the 6th. They waited a month, make sure he's going to make it all right, you know. Got back in the car and headed to the valley. But 
they didn't have any money. And they did not know what to do. Well, you've heard of Charles Butt, the son of Howard E. Butt, the owner of H-E-B. They were stationed. They were the office headquarters, had been in um, San Antonio, not, not San Antonio, it had been, I forget, but it, they had moved it. They had actually moved the headquarters here to Harlingen. In fact, the second and third HEB stores, grocery stores, were built here in Harlingen. It was downtown, right, just a couple of blocks over there. Harlingen School District now owns the building. And that was the first HEB store in Harlingen, and Howard Butt had a house right over here about a half a mile away from here. And you can look it up online, the H.E. Butt home of Harlingen, Texas. And he was here for several years. And then they moved it to Corpus Christi. And then from Corpus Christi to San Antonio. Well, they were in Corpus Christi in the 1950s, and so my dad was passing through. Well, Howard Butt was a Southern Baptist. And he was somewhat familiar with my dad's family and their church. They went to First Baptist Church of San Antonio, and Howard Butt was familiar with them. And so he was given a letter of recommendation. And so about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, my dad drove up to HEB headquarters in Corpus Christi and asked to speak to Mr. Butt, Howard Butt. And Mr. Butt received him. And my dad said, we're headed to the valley. I've got a newborn baby, two sons. We're going to, going to be missionaries. And I'm almost out of money. Can you help me? And Mr. Butt gave him $50. $50. Now, mind you, this is 1957. That's like giving him $500. And my dad, forever grateful to the Howard Butt family for getting us to the valley. We found a little small apartment just a few blocks away from here, over here on First Street. and set up home. My dad went to Woolworth. There was a Woolworth here in Harlingen at the time. My dad went to Woolworth, applied for a job, and he became a Woolworth sales clerk. And that was the beginning of their ministry. They lived on, they moved over to Teague Road over here. Irma used to live on Teague Road, and that's actually how Irma, because her family lived just down the road from our family. I was born, they got here in 1957. I was born in December of 1958. And my mom would sit outside in the afternoon, dirt road. There was a colonia back down the road from where we were living, and my mom would sit outside, and as the children were walking because the bus would drop them off down the road. And so as the kids were walking, my mom would sit there with a table with cookies and Kool-Aid. And as the children would pass by, she would give them cookies and Kool-Aid and invite them to Bible class. And so they started a Bible club. Dad went to the church. It was a small Baptist church that he was attending. Dad went to the church, asked if they could start an afternoon Sunday school on Sundays. They started an afternoon Sunday school, taking the Bible club kids to church for their own church service. That Sunday school turned into a mission, and the mission turned into a church, Iglesia Bautista Gracia. 
And that church survived for 35 years. In 1982, I became the pastor of that church, walking in my dad's footsteps. In 2013, we became messianic. What I'm telling you is this ministry, where you're sitting today, is a direct result of mom and dad's ministry 66 years ago. I'm here because of them, and you're here because I'm here. So very quickly. It was my mom and dad who taught me not to quit. Not to give up. Mom and dad faced many, many hardships. We grew up poor. I mean, poverty poor. We could have <coughs> been on food stamps. In fact, when I was little is when they first started handing out food stamps, and we could have been on food stamps, but mom and dad would not accept food stamps. They wanted to make their own way. And I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that this was their heart and their mind that God would provide. And in fact, we had a rule because they also ran a youth camp every summer, several weeks of the summer, inviting kids from the church and absolute strangers to come out to the farm and spend a week with us, having a good time, Bible Lessons, missionary lessons, swimming, croquet, baseball, football, you name it, we did it. And mom and dad went through difficult times. But we had a rule at camp. And that was this. We had two rules at camp, and they were this. Number one, rule number one, instant and cheerful obedience. That was rule number one. Instant and cheerful obedience. And that covers all the rest of the rules. But we did have a second rule. We eat what the Lord provides. We did not throw food away. We did not throw food away. But you see, that was the rule in our family. You eat what God provides. So there were days when we ate turnips, and I can tell you, I did not like turnips. There were days when we ate greens, and I'll tell you, and I mean turnip greens, and I'll tell you, I did not like turnip greens. There were days when we ate liver. And when I tell you days, I'm talking about like days in a row, like it was turnip, 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 greens, 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 liver, liver, liver. Because we were poor. A farmer would come by. I'm not kidding you. A farmer would come by every now and then and he would tell my dad, he would honk his horn, sit out there on the road, honk his horn. Dad would go out and he'd say, I killed a calf. I brought you some liver. He couldn't bring us prime steak or ribeye. He brought us the liver. Thank you for the liver. And so he would bring a give dad the whole liver. And dad would thank him profusely because he had food to give to his children and put it in the freezer. And every night for a couple of weeks, mom would be slicing off liver. Farmers would call us up and say, we're going to plow under our carrots. Come and get as many as you can. And dad would pick us up, 
cold winter days because that's when they grow carrots, cold winter days, and dad would come and pick us up from school. In the station wagon and in, in the bo- back would be boxes and boxes and boxes. Up on top of the roof would be boxes and boxes and boxes, and he would drive us out to that field, and we'd be out there on a drizzly cold afternoon after school picking up carrots, filling up boxes, putting them in the car. And then we would go home and we would have carrots and carrots and more carrots and more carrots. I'm not kidding you. We had carrots. We had cooked carrots, stewed carrots, raw carrots, carrot cake, carrot ice cream, carrot slaw, carrot this, carrot that, carrots, because we had pile a pile of carrots sitting out in the yard. Farmer would call us up and say, we have a, we, we're plowing under cabbage. Come and get what you can. And Dad would take us out there, and we'd be out there picking up cabbage, picking up cabbage, picking up cabbage. And we'd have a pile of cabbage out in the yard. And then we would come home from school, and we would be chopping cabbage. I'm not kidding you. We would be chopping cabbage, chopping cabbage. And Dad had a, one of those old crank slaw makers, and we would be putting cabbage into the slaw maker, making slaw, making slaw. And then he would put it into the big bin, and he'd make sauerkraut out of it. We ate what the Lord provided. You know what? I still don't like turnips. But I grew to be okay with turnip greens. And I enjoy it ever. Why? It goes back to my child. Proverbs 22, 6. Train up a child. In the way he shall go. And when he is old, he will not turn from it. Can I share something with you? I am what I am today because my parents were who they were. They were faithful to God and they trained me to be faithful to God. People don't understand when it says when they're old that they will not turn from it. It doesn't mean that your children aren't ever going to make a mistake. And it doesn't mean that your children aren't going to take a bad road. They will. Not they might, they will. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to make bad decisions just like you did. But what it means is this, if you instill in them the word of God and the things of God and the doctrines of God, they will return to God. And I can tell you that that is true. Can I tell you that I started learning Bible verses before I ever went to school? Mom would sit us down, and she would go over it, take it apart word by word, put two words together, put three words together, for God, for God so, for God so loved the world, and make us repeat it over and over and over again. Every day for a week, every day, every day, every day, repeating it, repeating it until it was drilled into my heart. And today, and this is why when I'm sitting here teaching you, I can quote to you from memory verse after verse after verse after verse because my mother sat me down as a little child and began to teach me the word of God. And she had us memorizing verses until I left for college. Even in junior high, even in high school, we were still learning verses every week. My mom would wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning every single morning. 
And sometimes we would get up early and sometimes we would have to get up early to because we hadn't finished our homework and things like that. And we'd have to go, and we'd, we'd go downstairs and there we would see mom on her knees in the kitchen, on her knees, pray to God for her family, for her children. And do you know that mom did that? Until six months ago when she had that, when she started stroking and she couldn't do it anymore. Do you know that mom had a notebook through which she went every single day, line by line, praying for all of her children, praying for many of you, praying for this ministry, praying for friends and family, prayer requests. It would take her an hour, sometimes two, to go through it. But every day she went through that notebook praying. I am what I am today. Because my mother taught me the scripture. Because my mother taught me to pray. And do you know that on the way to school, every single morning, my mom would have us pray before we went to school. Every day. On Saturdays, we woke up. Before we turned on Bugs Bunny, we prayed. Every Sunday before we went to church, we prayed. She set her face like a flint for her purpose, and her purpose was to raise her family for God. And she would not be persuaded otherwise. So Psalm 119, 11 says, Your word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against you. I close with this. John chapter 13 and verse 34. Mom taught us how to love with unconditional love. John 13, 34, Yeshua says, As I have loved you, so also you must love one another. Love does not necessarily mean approval. Because I can tell you there are many times and many things that mom did not approve of. And by the way, she was not shy. Whether she knew you or she did not knew you, if she had something to say to you, she didn't mind telling you. And the older she got, the ornery, more ornery she got. She wasn't afraid to give you a piece of her mind. But she always did it with loving kindness. She always did it with loving kindness. There was only one rule that we had. There was one unfor unforgivable sin with my mom. And that was this. If you ever run away from home, her words, don't come back. Why? Harsh? Well, I'll tell you, none of her kids ever ran away from home. Because she had invested so much compassion and love. That for her, that was the unforgivable sin. One time I did threaten to run away from home. 
I wasn't very old. I got upset about some little thing. I don't know what. And so I said I was going to run away from home. So one of my brothers went and squealed on me. Because that's what brothers do. And she came to me and she said, I hear you're running away from home. I said, yes, ma'am. Because you're always respectful. She is your mother. She said, okay, but understand this. If you go out that door, you're never coming back in. And you're taking nothing with you. Nothing. I said, but I'm going to need clothes. She said, that's too bad. She said, I bought those clothes. They're mine. I'm just letting you use them. I said, okay, well, the clothes that I'm wearing. She said, nope, not even that. I said, you're going to send me out there naked? She said, those are my clothes. If you want to run away, go ahead, but take your clothes off first and then run. I said, this is not fair. So I didn't run away. My sister had a big trunk. She was like six years old. She had a trunk which she kept all her dolls in. I saw her one day, one Saturday afternoon, sitting out by the dirt road, sitting on her trunk. And I went out there and I asked her, what are you doing? And she said, I'm running away from home. And I said, well, you haven't got very far. She said, I know. And I said, well, why are you sitting here? Are you tired already or what? Why, why are you sitting here? And she said, because dad won't let me cross the road. True story. I said, well, you might as well take your box. I'll help you take your trunk back into the room, into your room, because you can't run away this way. What I appreciated about my mother is that she loved us the way God loves us. Unconditional, overwhelming, never-ending love. Not saying that she was always happy with us. She wasn't. Not saying that she was like, hey, mom, mom would, she could lay on the guilt trips hard. We'd be on the way to school and she'd burst out crying because we didn't get dressed fast enough or whatever. And we'd be on the way to school and she would burst out crying. Y'all are going to put me six feet under. She told us that. You see these white hairs on my head? They're from you. She would tell us that. We broke her heart sometimes. But she never gave up on us. Never, never, never. And she loved us unconditionally. But because she loved us unconditionally, she was not afraid to confront us when she thought or knew we were doing wrong even as adults with our own families. She was not afraid of confrontation. And even when we hurt her, Yet still she loved us. And you know what? If I had run away from home, she 
she still would have taken me back because that's the kind of mom she was. Even though she said she wouldn't. She was putting the fear of God in us is what she was doing. Because we did many things much worse than running away from home. And she still forgave us and took us back. her very last words to me last Sunday night were I love you too. She whispered those words. I kissed her on the forehead and I said, I love you, Mom. And she said, And so I'm here to tell you, you too can learn lessons from my mom. Be faithful to God in everything you do, and don't be turned aside. Train yourself and train up your children in the way they should go. Learn scripture, pray every day. Do good. Do what is right. And love one another with an overwhelming love. And don't just say you love. You know, that's why we have Olneg every day, every Shabbat. That's what Olneg is all about so you can get to know each other. That's why we started it. That's exactly why we started it. So you could have fellowship, so you could, because it's hard to have food in front of you and sitting across from somebody else and not have a conversation. And when you have conversation, you get to know. My father, my king, I have nothing but overwhelming praise for you today. for the mother that you gave to me and the father who raised us to cherish our relationship with you above all else. Because of the conviction of your Holy Spirit and because of the love and because of the training of my mother and my father, I'm here today. For these 45 years teaching others. Father, as you taught them to love, they taught me to love, and so I love. All who come my way. And it's not always easy because to love is to be hurt. And we've been hurt. But it's worth it. Because to not love is to not know love. And so, Father, we ask for your encouragement. We ask, Lord, that you would breathe upon us, speak to us day by day. Help us to do these things. Help us to follow the examples that were set before us. As Hebrews 12, 1 says, Seeing we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, lay us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Yeshua, the author and finish of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame. And it sat down at the right hand of the Father for who could endure such a contradiction of sinners against himself? 
lest we be weary and faint in our minds. So, Father, rather than looking at the bad examples around us, let us look to the good example. Whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are noble, whatsoever things are holy, whatsoever things are right, think on these things. Bless us now, Father, as we have Oneg together and then go our way for the rest of the weekend. Bring us back again together next Shabbat, Father. Bless Raymond as he speaks next week. May your Holy Spirit fill him and guide him. Bless his congregation. We ask through Yeshua, through his precious blood, and all God's people said, Let's stand for the blessing, please. If you would lift up your hands. Yevarecha donai ve yishmerecha Yaira donai panavalecha Vihuneka Yisa donai panavalecha Ve yasemlecha Shalom. May Adonai bless you and keep you. May Adonai shine his face upon you and be gracious unto you. May Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and fill you with peace. From the Prince of Peace, Yeshua Mashiach, the Imru. Amen. Shabbat